So 30 years ago, I was invited to join an academic experiment. I didn't realize that the experiment was starting a new discipline, and I didn't really understand that the true experiment was actually my career. <laughs> but what's happy for me now is I've got 30 years of data in this wonderful interdisciplinary space called science communication. And I've ended up here in Canberra, Australia, which I think is a real hotspot for science communication in the world. So I wanna share with you a few of our results from this 30 year interdisciplinary experiment. Now, 30 years ago, science communication was something that people thought about as just happening when scientists opened their mouths. But now we understand that science and its science society relationship is something that needs a bit of care, attention, and study. So 30 years on, there are programs around the world that teach science communication, both to scientists, but also train science communicators and scientists warmly embrace it. But in addition to helping scientists communicate better, we need a lot more work, and we're doing it right now in the midst of this crisis, on science and society relationships. Those kinds of things that support good communication. Now, it doesn't mean that it isn't difficult. It doesn't mean that we aren't currently being tested. We certainly are. Indeed, six months into the COVID-19 epidemic, Science communication can be seen to have gone fairly well in some places, I think in Australia. Uh, we've done very well in the sense of flattening the curve. Flattening the curve itself is a brilliant metaphor that helps us understand the, the pandemic better. Some places, science communication has gone less well, and that's part of the reason why um, people are suffering perhaps more than they need to. And then there's just been some weird stuff that has happened. So for example, who ever thought that the head of the Center for Disease Control Anthony Fauci in the United States would be played by Brad Pitt on Saturday Night Live. That's just weird. However, now to take stock of where we are now, I wanna think about a few um, important features of science communication. I wanna talk a little bit about trust and I wanna talk about the importance of community. And where I wanna end up in this conversation with you is to talk about what we need to do next. And that is to arrive at a place where we can reason together about science, bring it more into our lives, and have more impact on it. And I think this is a real opportunity coming out of this crisis. So the reason why science communication is difficult, after reflecting on this for 30 years, I've come to think it's not because science is difficult, though it is. And of course, science is a huge and broad, vast array of disciplines, everything from quantum physics to psychology via epidemiology right? All sciences, it's all difficult. But communication too is really, really difficult. It's hard. If you reflect a little bit about what communication really needs to do, you'll understand what I mean. Communicare, the Latin word that we take communication from, it points to all of those words like common, communion, and community itself. Communication, the whole point of it is to take things that are disparate and bring them all together and so that we can have common understanding. And for that to happen, a lot of things have to be in place. There needs to be a lot of interpersonal cooperation. And when I think about the first rule of communication, which is know your audience, I'll quiz you on that later. And then I go into the second rule of communication, which is actually building trust. You see how difficult and, and how much is needed, how many prerequisites they are really for good communication. So let's talk about trust for a moment. I know there's a lot of concern about trust in science, especially when we talk about anthropogenic climate change and people having some disbelief um, in the reasons for it, or when we think about people who are hesitant about vaccination. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But actually, I'm a glass half full kind of person. Trust in science is actually high. Now, my evidence for this comes from a series of polls around the world um, in the US. Um, the Pew Trust does a series of these studies that I recommend to you. But in the US, what's really interesting is in studies, people find that um, people's trust in science is actually higher than their beliefs in any one science being true. Now that's just weird, okay? But that's America. Um, however, it is true that Americans, even when they're skeptical about individual scientific results, still feel that scientists are trustworthy. Europeans, trust scientific advice above every other form of advice, including politicians' advice. And they opine that in emergencies, 
scientific advice should be privileged over all other forms. Now, we may not have to agree with that, but that's a very high trust in science. Now, in Australia, I'm very lucky that I'm in the center with a colleague who does the Australian polling. And the CPAS ANU poll has found that 90% of us Australians feel that science has made life easier overall. 80% say the benefits of science have been greater than the harmful effects. There are some concerns. Australians say they're worried that um, maybe about half of us feel that science has changed our way of life a bit too fast. But we recognize that perhaps maybe it's made it easier overall. Interest in science topics, for example, in the news and media, this might surprise you. 67% of people say they want to hear about more health issues in their news feed. Others, 64% want new medical discoveries. 60% want to hear more about science discoveries. And what I find most interesting is that 41% of Australians claim that they are not at all interested in sports news. They want more science than they want sports. Now, my colleague ensures me that this is a robust, robust finding. It is a real finding, um, but I think it, there might be something peculiar going on there. Australia, Australians liking science more than sports. The top three professions that Australians rate is contributing a lot to the well-being of society. Scientists, 80.9%. Doctors, followed by doctors, and then farmers. The most frequently rated with negative contributions are priests, ministers of religion, and politicians. Only 10% they think politicians contribute a lot to society. So society, scientists enjoy an enormous amount of, um, of, of indicators, the prerequisites for trust. Now I submit to you that this is a pretty good baseline for Australia to work with as we go through the COVID-19 pandemic, right? But what could go wrong? And here I just wanna dive into three quick examples of how um, science communication has, has looked at some historical episodes that tell us a lot about what we're going to need as we come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thinking back, well, for some of us, it's all, it's history, to 1953, where Jonas Salk, in a radio announcement, predicted that he had a vaccine almost at the ready. There was celebration around the world. By 1955, after a clinical trial for that vaccine, the US FDA approved the vaccine the same afternoon. By 1961, polio infection was down in the US by 90%. On the day that the vaccine was made available, church bells rung. People took off work. There was mass celebration, perhaps what we might be expecting some months in the future. So it's a success story, sort of. But if you were alive between the years 1955 and 1961, it didn't seem as easy as all this. A month after the vaccine was licensed, a California company was found to have improperly killed the virus in some batches of vaccine. Over 200,000 children were vaccinated with this tainted virus. There were 11 deaths and 200 cases of polio ensued. Rumors circulated around that time about who was going to get the vaccine first. Shortages meant that there was going to be a black market in vaccines, and there were remarkable tales of drug company shareholders standing in queue to get the first vaccines. And the Associated Science Communication? Well, Jonas Salk, interesting figure, was a celebrity scientist of sorts, and he became deeply unpopular as he became associated with the controversial aspects of this vaccine. Discussions about funding the vaccination program were counted by, were, were kind of boiling over amongst politicians. So political discourse was kind of roiled by what was happening with this vaccine. Distru distrust festered in vaccination, um, which they tried to counter with a national education campaign, where giving the facts of vaccination. It was a very, very limited success. And so vaccine hesitancy continues, and some people go back to this, this, for this polio vaccine as where that hesitancy started. It shows itself to be resistant, and it's resistant to the resolution um, of telling people the facts of the matter, because the distrust of this episode sort of ate away at them. But these are, similar, these are likely similar problems that we're going to face when a vaccine is found. Even with the high levels of trust that I've just tried to convince you that we we have in science. Trust can be squandered 
right? Which makes communication impossible. We gotta worry about what happens when we follow one scientist to, to exclusion of others. And given a platform, celebrity scientists are a bit of a mixed bag. Their communication may need extra scrutiny. And finally, we learned from this episode that facts don't build trust, experience does. So communicating to people's experiences is absolutely critical in many areas of science communication. And you're probably thinking to yourself at this point, gosh, this, none of this is about the science. It's all about the communication. And to that I say, yes, yes. That's one of the things we've learned over 30 years of science communication research. It's rarely about the science and mostly about the communication. I'll give you another quick example. I love this one. In the late 1980s, some of you may remember, um, and for others, a little wee history lesson here, that there, is a, there was a terrible nuclear explosion in Chernobyl that happened in 1986. There were worries across Europe about radiation spread. And in a bucolic part of the UK called Cumbria, sheep came under scrutiny. And Cumbrian sheep farmers found themselves enduring huge financial losses and restrictions, right? The restrictions were placed on, the, on their sheep um, as, as wool and meat providers. And it was, it was a terrible time. It turns out, after a bit of investigation, that the radiation in Cumbrian sheep didn't come from Chernobyl, but it came just down, from just down the road in Sellafield, a nearby town in the UK. But in exploring the issue, something probably even more terrible happened. Government scientists, armed with clipboards and a healthy dose of confidence in their own expertise, invaded the Cumbrian fields and immediately got the farmers offside. The farmers felt that they knew their sheep, their habits, and the ecology of the region, but that knowledge was deemed to be folk belief, not worth anything. Farmers were ignored, and this meant the kind of truth and gravity of the situation went unremarked for an unacceptably long time. Now, this is a canonical study. Anybody looking into the area of science communication probably has read a little bit about the Cumbrian sheep farmers. It underscores that knowledge is based in communities needs to be given status, opened up for discussion, and not assumed away. It also deserves to be communicated. There are many, many other examples like this. The recent crisis um, with Ebola. We can, um, we can point to also looking at um, the smallpox vaccination. These examples are very rich um, in looking at the history of science communication. And from those, we take a series of, method, of messages. One is that trust is absolutely crucial and it's easily squandered. Second, celebrities mix bag. Third, facts don't build trust. Relationships and experience build trust. Also, there's knowledge in communities right, that we need to acknowledge is setting aside scientific knowledge. And finally, we need to be thinking about how it feels when we go and correct information. When we correct misinformation out in the world, we're also making a comment about the people who hold that information. Those kinds of relationships are also very important. And one might be taking away trust and thus correcting misinformation is never gonna work because communication won't happen at all. So, as we go forward, if we can think of these messages that we've gotten from over 30 years of research, we need to be able to take these and reason together a little bit as we start communicating solutions. Communicating science, not to people, but with people. What does this look like? Very quickly, one, we can expect that our trust is gonna to continue to be tested. Whether it's the vaccine scenario that I've outlined or perhaps there'll be some missteps along the way. Here in Canberra, we've built an amazing field hospital on a cricket oval. And it was built because at the time, the prediction was that Canberra was going to suffer some of the um, uh, levels of illness and hospitalization of the rest of the world. Happily, we did not. And so the hospital sits there. But what's so re interesting to me about it is I've heard very, very few complaints about this. We feel grateful that it sits there. And we also recognize the reasons why it sits there because they were explained to us at each step. Basically what happened was our scientific leaders, epidemiologists and people who work in the hospital, they showed their work. They told us why they were making those decisions. And that matters. That matters a whole bunch. So we're going to have to expect our trust to be tested, our, our trust to be very much tested in these times, 
But at the same time, I don't think we should get too concerned because if people show their work, we will have opportunity to interrogate it. Second thing I believe that's going to happen um, is that we're going to get more and more conflicting expert advice. There won't be just one voice of science. There are going to be many. So this is good. Again, I say not to be feared. As long as they clearly show their work, this is more different than one message for all audiences. It is working ideas through the public. I think we, I see a glimmer of hope. I mean, in Australia, public practitioners have clearly communicated the limits of their knowledge. And I've also heard some of our um, media scientists and doctors being very unafraid to walk back their assessments and talk about why they've made the decisions that they did. This is important. So we shouldn't be afraid of conflicting advice. It's actually gonna help us make better decisions. And finally, I think we're gonna head out of COVID-19 with much more community involvement in science. Over the past five years, maker spaces, open labs, citizen science, where citizens contribute to scientific projects have flourished. Australia last week just issued citizen science stamps to put on your, on your letters. So I expect much more direct engagement going into the future, but it can't be that just scientists invite that participation. Citizen science is great, but we also need to know more about scientists as citizens. What are the values that they're bringing to their science? And they can articulate those to us so we can see those values and debate them. Our problems don't happen in labs, so we need to know about what values scientists bring with them when they begin to tackle some of our larger social problems. So, 30 years of a science communication experiment has run its course. We know a lot. We've got a million and one examples of how to do science communication better. And sometimes um, we can see clearly where things went wrong. We know it works. We know it doesn't in the public communication of science. And the bottom line is trust and community are far more important than communicating facts and correcting unscientific beliefs. And probably the best thing for me is I no longer get asked, science communication, is that a thing? It so is a thing. And with science communication having 30 years of experiments behind it, I think now we're ready to take another great leap for another big experiment. Thank you. <laughs>